So thank you for the introduction and uh, good afternoon. So I'm going to present some work that we did on the dragonfly handshake. And this was done in collaboration with uh, Eyal uh, Ronen. Um, so the dragonfly handshake has uh, recently been uh, used in WPA3, which was announced about a year ago. And the dragonfly handshake before that was actually already in use by the EAP PWD protocol. Now, what is the EAP PWD protocol? Well, it's another protocol in Wi-Fi, which is used by a small amount of enterprise Wi-Fi networks where you authenticate using a username and password. For example, about 2 to 5% of Ethereum networks use EAP PWD, and that also uses Dragonfly. So let's first briefly introduce what the Dragonfly handshake actually is. So the Dragonfly handshake is uh, a PAKE, it's a password authenticated key exchange, which in practice means that uh, authentication happens based on a shared password. And besides that, the Dragonfly handshake also negotiates a fresh session key, which after the handshake can be used to encrypt actual data traffic. Now, the interesting property that Dragonfly and a lot of other PAKES provide is that it uh, offers forward secrecy and it protects against dictionary attacks. And that's a huge advantage compared to WPA2, for example, because with WPA2, an adversary can just passively capture a handshake. He, can, he or she can take that handshake offline and do a dictionary or brute force attacks against it. Now, a few other pigs also have another property, namely that they protect against uh, what I called here server compromise. Uh, in other words, there are also augmented and asymmetric pigs where if, for example, the server is compromised, it's difficult for an attacker to then try to recover the original password. So you can think of this that the server can store a salted version of the password in a sense. Unfortunately, Dragonfly does not provide that property. So with Dragonfly, if you manage to compromise, for example, the access point or the router, you have enough information to uh, print at, pretend to be a client. So let me give a high level overview of how Dragonfly works. So let's say we have a client that wants to connect to an access point. Then the first thing that needs to happen is that the password, which is, for example, stored in ASCII, it needs to be converted to a so-called group element, which I will represent using P. Uh, and this P can be used in the actual cryptographic calculations. Once this is done, um, the handshake essentially consists of two main phases. The first is the commit phase, where we negotiate the shared secret. And then we have a confirm phrase where both parties essentially confirm that they negotiated the same key and that they both are using the same password. Now, what's the interesting uh, part here? Um, the interesting part is how the password is converted to a group element P, because this is where a lot of uh, vulnerabilities on a lot of side channels occur. Now, before I get into that, there's one important remark. And that is that the Dragonfly handshake can be executed using both so-called mod P crypto groups and using elliptic curves. So let me first zoom in into the mod P groups. Um, first, very quick background, what are mod P groups? It basically means your uh, calculations are done modulo P, um, hence the name as well. But what's more interesting here is how is the password converted into a member of the crypto group. And a naive first attempt would be the following algorithm. Basically, you take the password here using, represented using PW, you hash it together with the MAC addresses of the client on the access point, and you interpret it, the resulting value um, as an integer. Then you just calculate some form formula here, which converts it into a member of a, the mod P group. And this would be, this would work well, except there is one small problem. And that is for certain mod P groups, the prime of the group 
Um, well, actually, the value, the resulting value here, might be bigger than the prime of the group that is being used. Now, one simple solution would have been to simply take the hash here and then do modulo p, so mod p, to get uh, a number smaller than p. But that introduces a small theoretic uh, bias into this value. So how did they decide to tackle this instead? Well, they decided to add an if test here. And if the value is bigger than p, then we actually include a counter here. And if this value is smaller than p the first time, we simply increase the counter, try again, until we finally have a value uh, that is smaller than p. So most of you can probably already see the problem here. Namely, the number of iterations that are needed here depends on the password. And in fact, this was already pointed out by the IETF on CFRG when this algorithm was being proposed. Um, so already um, back in 2010, when uh, there was the first standardization effort of Dragonfly, in the mailing list it was mentioned that you know, this design is susceptible to timing side channels and it may leak the password. And what they recommended to do is to exclude the MAC addresses from this algorithm. Because then you only need to execute this algorithm once and not every time that the handshake is executed. Now, what was the reply at least at the time? Well, the reply at the time was, well, I'm not really sure how important this is. Um, they thought it wouldn't leak the shared password and that the resulting attacks are quite complicated. Now, their opinion changed a bit over the years, but initially, that was the reaction. So let me come back to this first remark here that it's uncertain whether this really leaks the shared password or not. So what can we as an attacker do? Well, let's say that an access point is using WPA3 with this algorithm that we just saw. As an adversary, I can then try to connect as a client, for example, using the client uses MAC address A, and using a timing attack, I can measure how many iterations that the access point needs. And let's say that I measure, okay, the access point needs two iterations to convert the password into a mod P element. And I then have a dictionary of possible passwords. Here I just have three as an example. And what I can then do as an adversary is run this algorithm on my own laptop and see how many iterations are needed for a specific password and see if it match matches my observation. So here in this example, password one uses a different amount of iterations, so I know that password is not in use. But there's still a lot of other possible passwords that remain. So how can I gain more information as an adversary? Well, Remember that this algorithm here depends on the MAC address of both the client and uh, the access point. So I can just spoof a different client MAC address. I can again measure how many iterations are needed and I can just repeat uh, this process. So here in my example, password two would use a different amount of iterations uh, if I spoof client address B. So I can again exclude uh, this password. And I can keep doing this uh, for another MAC address, and so on, until I uh, uniquely identified the password in my dictionary. To give you an idea how many MAC addresses you need to spoof for this, let's say you use uh, the Rockyou uh, password dump, then you need to spoof around 17 MAC addresses to be able to uniquely uh, recover the password. So that's not too much. And the main takeaway lesson here is that the amount of iterations that are needed to convert the password into this mod p element, if you measure it for this for several MAC addresses, then you essentially have a signature of the password, which you can use in offline brute force attacks. And there's one thing I haven't discussed here yet, and that is, is making these timing measurements feasible in practice? Can I really determine how many iterations that the 
Mac that, for example, the access point is executing. So we tried this in practice. Uh, what we did is we took a Raspberry Pi 1. And the reason why we took a Raspberry Pi 1 is because its CPU is similar to home routers and even similar to some uh, professional access points. And on this Raspberry Pi, we ran host APD as the access point, which is the most widely used uh, software for Wi-Fi access points. It's used in home routers, used in even quite some professional access points. Uh, so that is the setup we used. And we noticed that measuring the m number of iterations is quite feasible under this setup. To give you a concrete number, if we make around 75 timing measurements per MAC address, we're able to determine how many iterations that the access point uh, needed. So that's quite feasible in practice. Now, recall that in the beginning of the talk, I said that we can use mod P groups, but that the handshake can also be used using elliptic curves. Now, I guess for this audience, I don't really need to introduce elliptic curves. Uh, basically, all operations happen on a point X and Y. X and Y have to satisfy a certain formula. The real question here is, how can we convert the password to a point on the elliptic curve so that we can then uh, use this point on the elliptic curve for our cryptographic operations? Well, initially, they proposed a very similar algorithm to the one for mod P groups. Namely, we again have a loop here with a counter. We calculate a hash based on the counter on the MAC addresses. The result is interpreted as the, sorry, as the X coordinate. And then we simply see if there is a solution for the Y coordinate. And in about half of the times, there is indeed a solution for Y. And we have found the point on the elliptic curve. Now, here, you can see that we again have exactly the same problem. The amount of iterations depends on the password being used. Unfortunately, for the EPWD protocol, which remember, it's used in certain enterprise Wi-Fi networks, um, there are no defenses against this timing leak at all. What's interesting is that for WPA3, they did realize there would be a timing leak here. So for WPA3, they decided to simply execute this loop always 40 times, and let's just ignore the computational overhead that this causes. Um, they decided to implement this defense here. And what's a bit surprising here is that in the case of elliptic curves, they have this defense against timing leaks, where they just always do 40 iterations independent of when the password element was found. While for the mod P case, they, don't, they didn't have this uh, defense. So that's, that's quite surprising. OK, so we have this defense. And there's one more thing I need to mention here. And in my opinion, it's a bit of a leftover of discussions that they had about this algorithm. And this is that for the extra iterations that are being performed to reach 40 iterations, they do these iterations based on a random password. So once we have an X and we have a solution for Y, we now do extra iterations based on a random password. Um, and you can just consider that to be a defense in depth. So far, this algorithm would actually be fine. And if we use NIST curves, there would be no timing leaks. But there's one problem. And that is that WPA3 also explicitly supports brain pool curves. What's the problem with brain pool curves? There, again, we have the case that the results here of our hash, hash function, the x value, it has a high probability of being bigger than the prime being used by our elliptic curves. And you can maybe see where this is going. They decided to handle this the same way as with mod p groups. If x is big, bigger than the prime, we just increase the counter and try again. Now, here we still do these 40 iterations, even in this case. But still, there's a problem here. Because if x is smaller than p, then this code here is skipped. 
And in particular, the amount of times that this code is skipped, again, depends on the password. There's one catch that makes this a bit more, uh, a bit harder to exploit in practice, because the amount of times that this code is skipped also depends on our random password that is used in the extra iterations. So that adds a bit of complexity. But this still leaks information because the variance of the execution time depends on when the password element was found. For example, if the password element was found here in the last iteration, then there are no extra iterations based on a random password, so there's basically zero variance. If the password element is immediately found, there are a lot of iterations based on a random password, meaning there's a lot of variance. On top of that, the average also still leaks uh, information as well, because that just average, averages out uh, this random noise. So now the question here again is, um, is this, are these timing differences measurable in practice? And without going into too much detail, yes, this is the case. But these timing measurements are a bit smaller than with the mod p uh, example that we had. And here we need about 300 measurements per MAC address to uh, gain useful information as an attacker. And the resulting timing measurements, they can again be abused in a similar way. They form a signature of the password, and we can use the signature in offline dictionary or brute force attacks. So this covers the timing attacks. Now, apart from that, we also looked at uh, other side channels, namely uh, cache attack side channels. So, Another way to attack this algorithm and to know when the password element is, find, is found is to, and I'm simplifying a bit here, but basically we can use flush and reload to detect when a solution uh, for Y has been found. Now there is one thing that makes, these, that makes this a bit more tricky is that we also need to know in which iteration this was found. So we don't just want to know, is this code executed? We want to know in which iteration was this executed. And in our specific example that we tried, we wanted to know, is this executed? And do we have a solution here in the first iteration or not? And to, able, to be able to determine this, we also used uh, a cache attack basically to monitor when this hash function here is being called. So in a sense, we monitor when this hash function is being called, sort of as a clock to determine in which iteration uh, we are. And we can do the similar thing for brain pool curves. We can also try to find out when here the x value is bigger or smaller than p by uh, monitoring when this function here is being executed that checks if there is a solution uh, for y. So, for brain pool curves, we roughly have uh, a similar cache attack. And these cache attacks are fairly uh, reliable in practice, the ones that we use. Now, these attacks do require a more powerful adversary than the timing attacks. We need to be able to run unprivileged code uh, on either the machine or the victim. Um, that's still quite feasible. We can, for example, imagine a malicious Android executable, or some previous works have shown that at least in older browsers, this may be possible even from JavaScript. So against the client, I think this is a realistic scenario. In theory, this would also be possible against the access point, but against an access point, it may be more difficult to uh, run malicious code uh, on that. Maybe the one exception here is, is, is if you set up uh, a hotspot on your phone, then it uh, would still be feasible. Now, the information that is leaked here in our cache attacks, we can use this, well, it, it again forms a signature of the password, basically. Just like the example we had previously, and the signature can be used to partition uh, a dictionary onto then uniquely recover the password once again. 
So that's actually quite interesting because for both the timing attack and the cache attack, the result is a signature of the password and this signature is used in a brute force algorithm and in fact is used in almost exactly the same brute force algorithm. So it makes a lot of sense to optimize the brute force, the dictionary attack algorithm and see how efficient th these attacks really are in practice. So what we did is we implemented the brute force on the dictionary attacks on GPU code. And we found that if we want to brute force 10 to the power 10 uh, passwords or a dictionary of that side, size, we need less than a dollar in Amazon uh, EC2 instances. Now, to give you some intuitive idea about this number here, this is bigger than all possible dictionaries or password dumps that you can find. It's bigger than the Rocky dump, it's bigger than all the passwords on have I been pwned, it's bigger than an English dictionary, so if you have a dictionary, you can brute force it using a dollar. At least if your timing attack or cache attack uh, succeeded. So that's quite a low amount of money, so we thought, okay, how about instead of just dictionary attacks, we also look at the complexity of full brute force attacks. So let's try to brute force all uh, passwords of eight characters over all possible symbols. Well, it turns out that if we then want to attack mod P or brain pool groups, this costs about $70, which is quite cheap in my opinion. If we want to attack NIST curves, then the brute force calculations is a bit more expensive because we have to check whether it is, there's a solution for Y, which is a bit more costly than checking uh, the case for the mod P on brain pool curves. In practice, this means that the cost is higher if this curve is being used. So that would cost about $14,000. Um, it's a lot more, but considering that, you know, this is a, pro this is a uh, encryption protocol that has very recently been proposed. This is quite a low amount for a modern protocol to be broken that easily. And if you want to know more uh, details about how we estimated this, or if you want to know the results for other sizes, uh, I referred to the paper where we analyzed this in a bit more detail. Okay, so Let's recap a bit. So far, we've had side channel attacks. We've had timing attacks where they were actually warned about these timing attacks, yet they didn't defend against them properly. We have new timing attacks against the brain pool case. We have uh, cache attacks. And on top of that, we're now also going to discuss some implementation specific vulnerabilities as well. And the first one that I want to discuss is an invalid uh, curve attack. So let's say we have the following situation. We have an access point here that we want to attack. And we as an adversary are going to send a commit frame. And this commit frame contains a point on the elliptic curve, but as an attacker, we can decide to send actually a coordinate that's not on the curve. Normally the access point is supposed to detect this, uh, but if it doesn't, we can carefully pick the X and Y uh, values to make sure that the secret key that is being negotiated is very predictable. So if the access point doesn't check whether X and Y is on the, is on the curve, the negotiated key is predictable, the access point won't realize this and it will just continue executing the handshake. Now in our specific case, uh, we can actually guess the negotiated key here with roughly 66% chance of having it right. So we can guess this key and then just try to complete uh, the handshake. And if our guess was correct, we successfully authenticated with the network and we're essentially impersonating a client. So which implementations were vulnerable to this? Well, we have all PWT implementations that were vulnerable. So this is free radius, this is host APD, this is uh, commercial clients. Every single one that we tested was vulnerable. With WPA3, 
we were able to test some early uh, implementations on open source ones. And there the situation, at least initially, seems a lot better because there only IWD is vulnerable. And IWD is a uh, relatively recent open source Wi-Fi client uh, for Linux. So I'm not going to go into detail here how, how uh, this invalid curve attack works in detail, how the X and Y is picked. There's a talk after this, which uh, the Bluetooth one, which I think goes into more detail about invalid curse attacks as well. Uh, so I'm just going to keep it at this high level. Another attack I instead want to discuss is um, a reflection attack. And in this case, I'm not going to assume we're attacking WPA3. In the example diagram here, I assume that we're going to attack um, EPWD. Now, why am I taking EPWD as a specific example here? Well, that's because with EPWD, the Dragonfly handshake is initiated by the access point. While with WPA3, the Dragonfly handshake is initiated by the client. And in this case, we can do something interesting. Namely, we can first go through the Wi-Fi association stage. The access point will then send the commit frame. And we, as an attacker, can just reflect exactly the same frame back to the access point with some minor changes. If the access point doesn't realize that this is a reflected flame, frame, it will simply continue the handshake. We can also then reflect the confirm phrase and we can then successfully complete the handshake without knowing anything, simply by reflecting these messages. And this is in a sense a very basic attack because we can fool the access point into thinking that a certain user authenticated with the network. Now, we won't be able to reveal the session key that is being negotiated here, so we cannot send client, so we cannot send traffic as the victim here, but in certain cases, this might still be useful. For example, you can imagine a case where if a user successfully connects to the, to the network, then maybe run some script or unlock some device. So admittedly, this is a bit of an edge case, but in certain cases, this might still be a risk. And normally implementations are supposed to uh, detect this. They are supposed to check whether this X and Y is the same one uh, as that the access point just sent. Now, here we have a bit of a similar story as before. All EAP PWD implementations are vulnerable, while with WPA3, the situation is a bit better. With WPA3, only old WP supplicants are affected. But this is a bit of a common theme that we noticed, namely uh, EAP PWD, the security of its implementations is um, a bit shaky in practice. So we actually have even more. Uh, we checked for more implementation vulnerabilities as well. And another interesting one that I want to highlight here is that we noticed one client, it's an EAP PWD client, that used bad randomness. In particular, it generated random numbers based on the system time on some other uh, input, but basically we could predict the random numbers that it was going to use. What's interesting about Dragonfly is that if we can predict the random numbers that a certain client or peer is using, we can recover the password element P. And then we can impersonate either the client uh, or the access point. So if bad randomness is used, the impact is catastrophic. And we noticed this in one case, but my hunch is that in practice, this might also occur on other devices. For example, if you have a cheap IoT Wi-Fi device, it may not have uh, the best source of randomness. So I think this might be a risk in practice. And what's interesting here as well is that the impact of bad randomness is actually worse with WPA3 than with WPA2. Because with WPA2, if you have bad randomness there, at worst, what you can do is a key reinstallation attack, or you might uh, 
when you want to do a dictionary attack, you can already do some pre-computations before you carry out the attack. But in general, the impact of bad randomness is worse with WPA3. One final implementation flaw that I want to discuss is, um, it's actually a side channel, but a bit of an implementation specific side channel. And it has a bit of an interesting history. Recall that in the beginning of the presentation, we had uh, this algorithm that converted the password into uh, a group element of the crypto group. And initially, EPWD didn't have a timing leak defense against this. But after a while, implementers did realize that this was a problem, and they decided to try to implement some countermeasure measure against this. And what Free Radius decided to do was, okay, Let's always do at least, uh, no, actually, I, I think they had no defense against this. They just tried to uh, find the password element, and once it was found, it returns. But there was another problem here, that if it needed more than 10 iterations, then the handshake would just abort. Now, that's problematic, because in one out of 2,048 uh, handshakes, you do need more than 10 iterations. So what can I as an attacker do? I can just initiate about 2,000 handshakes, and on average, one of them will fail. And if the handshake then fails, I know that, okay, that means free radius needed more than 10 iterations, and that gives me a lot of information about the password, and that leaked information I can again use to do a dictionary or a brute force attack. So here against free radius, you, you didn't even need uh, a timing attack or a cache attack. Simply perform about 2,000 handshakes. One of them, on average, will fail. That leaks information, and you can then recover the password. OK, so you might think now that uh, we covered most attacks. I mean, we had side channels, implementation flaws. But we're not quite done. One other thing I want to mention is some risks that are really specific uh, to Wi-Fi, at least in my opinion. The first one is that the access point here always needs to convert the password to a group element P when a client is connecting. It cannot do this computation beforehand because remember that the P here depends also on the MAC address of the client and you don't know this in advance. So every time the access point uh, notices that a client is connected, it needs to run this algorithm. The problem is this algorithm now, if you implement all the fences, needs to execute, sorry, 40 iterations all the t every single time. And that's a ton of overhead. And if you use uh, an elliptic curve of uh, around 500 uh, bit size, then we found, and this was against a professional access point that just recently supported WPA3, if you, make, if you forge eight connection attempts per second, then the access point is actually already fully overloaded, and it won't accept any other uh, WPA3 handshakes. So that's a very low amount. If you use a smaller elliptic curve of 256 bit, this is around 70 connection attempts, and then the access point overloads, but it's still not ideal. And this is, in fact, one of the big issues uh, with Dragonfly, is that you can either decide not to perform these iterations and be vulnerable to timing leaks, or you can implement these iterations and then risk denial of service attacks. So that as an implementer, you're always sacrificing something, which indicates that there's really some design flaws uh, with the handshake here. Another Wi-Fi specific attack I want to mention is that um, if you want to deploy WPA3, not all devices are immediately going to support it, so you want backwards compatibility. It's a usual story. The way that the Wi-Fi lines suggested to handle the backwards compatibility problem is to, uh, if you set up an access point, to 
configure WPA2 and 3 using the same network name and using the same password. Unfortunately, this is not uh, a perfect defense because, well, on one hand, it does prevent some attacks because let's say I have a client that supports WPA3 and an access point that supports both WPA2 and 3. If I would then try to act as a man in the middle and try to force the client into using WPA2, so if I, if I would try to downgrade it, the client would actually detect this attack because the WPA2 handshake does detect downgrades, uh, which in this case means that this setup does provide forward secrecy. But there is one rather big problem, and this is that a partial WPA2 handshake is still executed, and this partial WPA2 handshake is still sufficient to uh, then perform a dictionary attack. In other, words, in other words, the way that the Wi-Fi lines suggest to simultaneously use WPA2 and 3 at the same time is vulnerable to downgrades, meaning you gain little advantage of configuring your network in this way. So maybe you're now wondering, okay, can we defend against this at all? I mean, disabling WPA2 isn't really an option as at this time. And fortunately, there is one thing we can do and that is, as a client, as a client device, we can remember whether an access point supported WPA3 in the past. And if so, if it previously supported WPA3, we do not fall back to WPA2 automatically unless maybe the user explicitly enters the password again or some other indication. And this is similar to the trust on first usage of SSH and uh, also with certificate pinning on HTTPS. Uh, and the good news is that, for example, the Google Pixel 3 on the Linux uh, network manager, they have actually implemented this defense. So if you use those devices, you're not vulnerable to downgrade attacks. Unfortunately, uh, this isn't the only downgrade attack that there exists. The story goes on. Recall at the beginning of the presentation, I mentioned that this handshake can be used using mod p groups, it can be used using elliptic curves, and it can be used using quite a lot of elliptic curves, actually. Which make, makes you wonder, okay, how does it then negotiate which group to use? Well, it uses a simple mechanism here. The initiator suggests which group it wants to use, and the responder simply says yes or no. The problem is this reject message of the responder, it can very easily be spoofed. And after the handshake, there is no kind of mechanism to, de to detect if someone tried to manipulate or mess with the handshake. So as an attacker, all you need to do is, uh, for example, jam a message, which is feasible using cheap uh, Wi-Fi devices. Um, so basically, downgrade attacks are quite easy. And this is really a design flaw in the standard again, uh, and all implementations are vulnerable to this. The only defense against it is to only use uh, elliptic curves or mod p groups that you know that are secure. Uh, yeah. Okay, so that was downgrade attack number two. You think there's gonna be a third one? Well, there is, but it's not a downgrade attack against the specification or against the standard, um, but we also did notice a downgrade attack against two very recent implementations of WPA3. Namely, what we noticed there is if you set up a WPA3 only network and you connect to it using, for example, a Samsung S10, then this Samsung S10 should remember, oh, I connected to a WPA3 only network, so this password I should use only with WPA3. Well, it turns out if I set up a WPA2 network with exactly the same network name, then uh, the Samsung S10 on the IWD client will use that same password to connect to WPA2 as well, meaning you have exactly the same issues. Now, 
this is just an implementation flaw. It's not a flaw in the standard, uh, but it's still something interesting to highlight as well. Okay, so that was quite something, but we finally went through all the attacks that we found. The last thing I briefly want to discuss is the disclosure process that we followed. And our goal here was to disclose this as early as possible with the hope to influence WPA3 before it was deployed. A bit to our surprise, we were met with some skepticism here because initially they considered this to be implementation flaws, the standard is fine, we can just patch implementations and we're good. Um, there was even one surprising comment of one developer who said, oh yeah, we are, we're actually aware of one of the downgrade attacks that was discussed during some standardization meetings, we just forgot to warn about it. Okay. Um, so what was then the official reaction of the Wi-Fi Alliance? They privately created uh, security guidelines on how to properly implement WPA3. And in those guidelines, they said, brain pool curves are perfectly fine to use. You don't need extra defenses. But as I explained earlier in the presentation, even with brain pool curves, timing leaks, on, uh, timing leaks are possible. So we actually had to go through a small second disclosure to fix uh, the mistake they made in their security guidelines, which they privately created. So this is again also the same story, don't create guidelines in private, um, ask for feedback first. Now, even with these security guidelines of the Wi-Fi lines, there's still two major problems. The first one is that implementing WPA3 without any possibility of side channels is extremely hard. I, I would even compare it to the CBC mode attacks of TLS where if we keep using this, maybe every year we're gonna find some new attacks against this. And another problematic thing which I already highlighted is that to defend against timing leaks, they currently suggest using 40 iterations. Now this is quite costly especially on low weights, for example, IoT devices. And you may think now here that, oh, but that's okay, I have a powerful smartphone or laptop, I'll be fine, I don't care. Um, unfortunately, even if you have a powerful smartphone or computer, the WPA3 handshake, so Dragonfly, might be offloaded to the Wi-Fi chip itself, which is, again, a light, lightweight chip. So even if you have a powerful laptop, the Wi-Fi handshake it itself is handled using a lightweight Wi-Fi chip where these timing attacks might still be feasible. And unfortunately, this argument was the one that convinced vendors the most, I think, to update the standard. So on one hand, it's good that the standard is being updated. On the other hand, I have the impression that it's mostly done because of uh, the overhead issues here. Um, the good news is they are updating it, uh, so are, they are preventing the group downgrade attack. They are now allowing to do uh, a large part of this algorithm uh, that you can execute this when you configure the password, when you enter it, so, not, so that you have to do a lot less work for every individual handshake. Um, and on top of that, for the mod P groups, they are now prohibiting weak groups and they're moving to a constant time algorithm to convert the password into a group element. And the same thing is true for elliptic curves. There they are restricting the use of weak elliptic curves and they are again using, well, they are proposing to use a constant time algorithm. It still has to be approved. So all this might lead to WPA 3.1. It's unclear how this will be handled because these changes, they are not backwards compatible. Um, now, I recently saw some remarks where it was said that this update might be uh, seamless to the user, that the user might, may not notice a thing about this update, which to me might indicate that there's a risk of possible downgrade attacks back to the old WPA3. It's unclear how this will be handled, but that's a possible risk. Now, 
There's one last message I want to give to the ordinary Wi-Fi users, and that's that if WPA3 comes out, I still recommend to use it because at least for now, it still seems better than WPA2. Uh, yes, we have the side channels where we can then use uh, dictionary attacks on brute force attacks, but it's still harder to do these attacks with WPA3. With WPA2, these attacks are quite easy. With WPA3, it's harder. For example, making these timing attacks, it's harder to do that compared to just passively capturing a WPA2 handshake. So that gets me to the end of the talk. To conclude, WPA3 is vulnerable to side channels. The countermeasures against this are costly. Because of that, the standard is now being updated. And maybe the most interesting observation is that a lot of, at least quite some of these side channel issues could have been avoided. Remember in the beginning of the presentation where in 2010, someone recommended to exclude the MAC addresses from the algorithms that I discussed? If they would have followed this advice, a lot of our side channel attacks just wouldn't have been possible or they would have been a ton more difficult. So I guess the advice is don't just ask cryptographers for advice, listen to them as well. So with that, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Matty. Oh, thank you, Matty. Very great talk. Please. Um, regarding the mod P uh, the mod P prime, do you know where they got that from? Because I'm thinking, uh, you know, there are RFCs where the the modulus is like F F F F F F stuff F F F F F, mm -hmm. and the chances of it ever iterating are essentially zero. Um, now the mod P curves here have the the 160 bit. I guess Q, so they're different, not curves, different primes. Um, but they could have done the same thing, right? They could have found a, a, a prime that was almost two to the mm -hmm. 2048, yep. but still had a mod Q subgroup. But they didn't do that. Uh, so do you know where that curve, know where that prime came from? Is what so, I'm asking. Um, so they could have indeed used mod P groups where they wouldn't really have had this issue or at least have a very small chance that yeah. this value is bigger than the prime. I guess maybe one of the problems with Dragonfly is that they really try to support a lot of groups, including one of the mod P groups where this is an issue. So I would say that maybe the problem is that they, they wanted to support too many crypto groups than was really necessary. And because of that, they had one of these groups where yeah, it was an issue. But that seems to be the one that they're using. <laughs> um, or, yeah. Well, it, it's not the default one, but it is one that is officially supported in the standard, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. But you, you still don't know where they got it from. Uh, like, was it in a NIST standard or? A... Uh, it, it wasn't one of the RFCs or standards, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's, yeah. A, it's a group that was previously defined. Yeah, yeah, it could also I, be from IPsec. I yeah. thought the IPsec ones were the ones Hillary Orman designed, which which are safe primes, you know. But but it, it's okay. definitely not a new group. It's one that existed before. Okay, yeah. thank you. Hi, great talk. Um, I have a question regarding the invalid curve attacks. So from my own experience, it's quite surprising that you found so many of them because usually developers use libraries for this because they think elliptic curve is too spooky and too complicated. Why is this not the case in VPA3? Um, can you repeat the beginning of the question? Um, why are developers of VPA3 not using libraries because it's usually too complicated for them? Well, so does this refer to an invalid curve attack? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they are using libraries there. Um, so some implementations use OpenSSL, but they forgot to call the OpenSSL function that checks whether the point is on the elliptic curve. Um, and new OpenSSL versions do this implicitly, yes. but old versions don't, and quite some implementations still use the old version of OpenSSL where this is not checked. Okay, that explains it, thanks. <laughs> Sorry, I, was, I came in late, so maybe you've already addressed this. Um, if I'm moving around with my mobile and uh, addressing multiple Wi-Fi hotspots, um, the uh, it's going to have to go through, and in fact, it already is going through a lot of trouble to constantly check on the second and third best uh, access point. Uh, 
isn't this generating an enormous amount of computation for all the access points, even with no data actually being transmitted? Um, so is the question how much, so, so if you scan for networks. But I'm constantly you, scanning as I'm moving because I may have to switch within the next second, you know. So, well, that uses some amount of energy as well and computation, but I think that's still quite low compared to doing a WPA3 handshake. So you don't have to redo the, the basic handshake all over again. As uh, as so, so when you're just, so is the question when you are connecting to other networks or only searching? Well, no, you're, you're constantly searching, but you may immediately switch. So you, okay, you don't have yeah, time. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, you'll drop the, the, if you're on a phone call or something else. You, so in other words, you have to be prepared to switch at any, within, I don't know, 20 milliseconds or so. So, um, so just searching for networks, of course, doesn't involve the WPA3 handshake. Now, let's say you're walking around your house and you're constantly switching from access point to access point. Then it depends a bit what version of Wi-Fi you're using. There's one extension which allows you to seamlessly and more efficiently switch from one access point to another. If you don't have that update, it depends a bit how WPA3 is implemented. Mm -hmm. um, there it depends. Okay. Against some cases, you will have to redo, indeed, the complete WPA3 handshake every time. Mm -hmm. Against other cases, you don't, and you can reuse the previously negotiated session key, essentially. Because they're also talking now about putting Wi-Fi in cars and having the cars talk to one another on the, on the roads. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I think there they're counting on one of the extensions on, on, on Wi-Fi where you have like fast transition to handle that in a hopefully better way. So. Okay. Hmm. okay. Uh, I think if you have uh, further questions to Mati, you can ask him in the next coffee break. So thank him once again and see you in 30 minutes.